Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live. This is our fourth edition and we are so thankful to those of you who have joined us live. Today, I have a very special guest with me in studio. But before we get into the introductions, I want to remind you that Conversations Live is the place where ordinary people share their extraordinary stories, stories of inspiration, education, persistence, resilience, love, life, and lessons learned. And today, our topic will be life after retirement. And my special guest is someone that I've known for quite some time. She's also the mother of one of my best friends. So I am delighted that she's here to tell her story. Now remember, in the final 15 minutes of this program, we give you the opportunity to ask questions or to share your thoughts with Janet as she share her story, kindly encourage her. Now, if you're here for the first time, I invite you to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button and that notification bell that you will never miss another conversation. So thank you so much for joining us. And now let's get into it. I am going to welcome our special guest this afternoon. Now, let me also remind you to share the link with someone who needs to be inspired, maybe someone who is um, near to retirement and would want to you know, learn a little bit more about how to manage after retirement. I promise you, our guests has a compelling story, an exciting story. So, Janet, good afternoon. How are you? Good evening, Desreen. I am fine. I'm good, thank you. I am so excited to share my story with you and our viewers this afternoon. Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. Now, I know we're gonna talk about life after retirement, but now I want you to, as we do it on Conversations Live, to introduce yourself to our audience. Who is Janet Dawson? Well, I am Janet Dawson. I am a retired teacher who stayed the course for 38 years. I am a mother of three adult and incredibly supportive daughters. I'm also a grandmother of four awesome grandchildren. My grandchildren are Michael, Alexi Jade, Noah, and Nala Jo. I was married for 41 years, mm -hmm. but I am a widow since 2015. I am a very family oriented person. I love my family and I like family gatherings, which expands outside of my immediate family. It expands to my extended family. I love to cook, and my daughters can attest to that. I love to cook, I love to bake, and my specialty in baking, a mean Christmas cake. Wow. I love gardening because I love flowers. And it is said that I have a green thumb, but I also love, I love blooming um, flowers like orchids. So I wish I had an orchid thumb because I do well with all other plants except for an orchid. So there's, that's okay. it. Oh, thank you so much. So we have some things in common. I like to cook as well and bake, but I'm sure I can't do it half as well as you do. And I too wish that I had an orchid thumb it is true that they are very difficult plants to deal with, but I am sure that the other plants are telling you that you're still good with your plants. So thank you so much for sharing that about yourself. You're a mother, you're a grandmother, you're a teacher, you're a wife. Wow, so many things to tell. Now, I like to start this program usually from the beginning. So we are going to go back to your memory of yourself 
as a little girl. So please share with us, what was your childhood like? What was it like when you were growing up? Well, this, I had a fairly normal childhood. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a small district in the parish of Westmoreland because I'm from Westmoreland. So I grew up in a small district named George's Plain. I grew up with my stepmom and my and three other siblings. My father was in England, but I tell you, it's like he was present because mm -hmm. he stayed in England. He wrote letters. That's how we communicated then. And he would write us very often. And each person would get their own letter. And their the rules and regulations would be there. We had to attend church regularly. And so I grew up, it was a Seventh-day Adventist home. Mm -hmm. A strict environment, but at the same time, we had fun. We, because of how he saw to it that we had to go to church, I got very active in church at a very tender age. And you know all the, the responsibilities that go along in the Seventh-day Adventist church. I had many of them. Um, growing up, we were not, although he was in England, we were not burial children because he never sent burial. He would send money. He provided all the, res the necessary resources that we need for education and for what to make us happy and comfortable. So he would, um, he would send us, for example, as I said, the necessary um, things. So he would send school bag and school, sh and school shoes. But one thing happened is that when I started high school and I was supposed to have a special color shoes, he would all, we were supposed to wear black. And mm -hmm. he would always send a brown pair of brown square toe shoes. Mm -hmm. And I had to be getting, my stepmom had to give me a letter of excuse to take to the, um, the, the school, take to the principal oh. to say that my father in England um, sends it. We had, we had fun. I used to look forward to at Christmas time, we used to walk what we can't do now and we would walk um with our uh, my neighbors who were children like us right we would walk at 3 a.m in the morning mm -hmm. and we would walk and see carols it was it, it was so fun and and we would be allowed although the, the environment was strict but we were allowed to go on um church trips we go to church socials Right, and we would um, we would attend school functions, but it was it was it was a fairly normal, happy childhood. Yes, um, and when you compare that time to now, I, I hear you mention certain things that you could walk on the street at three o'clock in the morning and you were safe. I mean, even though I grew up in the seventies, that was the same thing. We were able to do that as well. And you know those those routine of caroling around the community and so on and so forth. So you spoke a lot about your dad and your stepmom. What about your mom? Oh, I I I went back to my mom in my the like my latter teenage years. Okay. So my mom was was so there for me when I started. I mean, maybe that will come further down in, in our interview. Okay, great. Great. My, my mom was, um, she babysat for me when I started having my kids, so. Okay, great. All right. So you stated in your introduction that you were a teacher, right? So what attracted you to that profession? I guess you could be a nurse or a police woman or, you know, but what attracted you to the teaching profession? And those were the common professions at that time. There's the, um, I'll correct you, I grew up in the 60s, not the 70s. So, no, I grew up in the 70s. But I'm so, right, so that's what I'm talking about. Mine was the 60s. Yes. Right, so 
I um I totally forgot what you yes. asked. What attracted you to the teaching? What attracted me yes. to teaching? And as I said, those were the common professions: mm -hmm. nursing, um, to be a policeman, or to be a teacher. Yes. But I mean, other than my love for um, children, what attracted me to the teaching profession was the subject that I taught. I had this special love for Spanish. Mm. And originally, I wanted to be an ear hostess because I had to do something that um, includes um, my Spanish that I love so wow. dearly. Yes. When becoming an ear hostess did not materialize, I said, okay, I have to do something mm -hmm. with my Spanish. So the next, the next best option was to teach it and to <laughs> share it. <laughs> Yes, yes. And so you learned Spanish in high school? Yes. Where did you go to high school? I went to the Manning School, the only traditional high school in Westmoreland. Okay. All right. And what was it like there in those days? Oh, high school was so, was so, I, I, I enjoyed um, high school. The transition for me was, was, was okay. Mm -hmm. And my very first, as I said, my very first Spanish um, class, that was what encouraged me and motivated me and made me want to stay in high school because I love languages and not only Spanish. My emphasis was on Spanish, mm -hmm. but I also loved French wow. and I loved the English language. So basically, so language is your thing. Yes. When linguistics is your thing. So, um, you know, you have taught for 38 years. So you would have taught the then generation and the now generation. But what was it like when you first entered the classroom compared to when you left? Oh, this. When I, I first entered the classroom before I became a trained teacher. So I entered the classroom as a pre-trained teacher. Okay. And I entered having to do with the, the, the younger ones, a grade one class. And honestly, I wasn't assigned, I was the only one, the only one assigned. I was assigned along with their experienced teacher mm -hmm. who guided me along. But this, I can tell you that then the children were more disciplined, their attitude was more positive. Mm -hmm. It was easier to work with them then than now. In, in, in my time of uh, my early days of teaching, you would never uh, experience children fighting in the class or, you know, erupt, the fight erupts while the teacher mm -hmm. is in their teaching. Mm -hmm. I experienced that in my latter years of teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different generation. Different. Different generation. Um, so you would have groomed thousands of students over the years. Yes, I have. Um, did you turn out a few linguists like yourself? Yes. Wonderful. Yes, I, 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 I did. Right now, there's a young lady in media. I'm telling you, when I, when I, I did a, a very short time at a traditional high school mm -hmm. and monthly they would get a monthly test but the test was not set by me okay i was employed for a teacher who was on leave at the time so the head of the department would set the, the paper mm -hmm. so i just impart she would tell me the chapters to go through, uh, the topics that I should cover. I cover the topics. And I remember the very first test, this young lady who is now in media, I see her on television quite often. And she came to me afterwards to say, um, you know, after the papers, the paper was marked and she got her grade. And she came to me and she said, this must be a miracle. I have never passed a Spanish test before. Wow. And 
not even had to pass so well, he got an excellent grade. Wonderful. Her mother even came to see me to see who is this miracle working teacher. <laughs> so much that when it was time for me to leave, students didn't want me to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They even staged a demonstration <laughs> in the principal's office, right? Wanting me to stay. Okay, and right. really, it, it's not that I knew the Spanish more than the other teacher. Mm -hmm. It's just that my level of patience and tolerance in teaching a foreign language mm -hmm. is very high. Yes. And thus, it affects my delivery. Mm -hmm. which would make it, you know, a little better. There is no way your, your delivery of a foreign language could be the same like the English language, mm -hmm. social studies, history, etc. Mm -hmm. Methods matter. The methods that teachers use to teach matters to students. So you have had a lot of success as a teacher. Congratulations on that. So if there, is someone, if there is someone in the audience right now, considering there are young people who watch this program, um, maybe there's somebody who's thinking about changing from what they're doing now to becoming a teacher. What advice would you give them as to what do you need to be a really good teacher? Go for this noble profession. Think about the lives that you're going to empower and transform Think about the great contribution you're going to make to the society and the world at large. That's the most noble profession. You empower lives, you change lives, you transform lives, you touch lives in a positive way. Also, you must have a love for the profession as well. Mm -hmm. And you also must have this high level of patience and tolerance. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. You know, that's what I remember about some of my best teachers. You talk about um, patience and tolerance and a love for the profession and they love the students as well. So right. they, 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 they took the time to, to, to work with us, to work us through the different, you know, as soon as we came across something we didn't quite understand, they were so patient in helping us to understand that so thank you so much for that there's there's somebody out there i'm sure um impacting lives as well you know that foundation that teachers gives us all of us no matter what our professions are it started with teachers such as yourself thank you so much for sharing that so now we're going to talk really get into the family side of things plus the profession so um being a working parent you know you said you had three children Right. And I'm sure you were working while you, you had those children. So what it was like, how did you balance parenting with your husband and as well as you were taking care of kids at school, the education and you're taking care of kids at home, education and parental care. How did you balance that? It was a journey and it was challenging mm -hmm. because I, I got married very early mm -hmm. and the family started immediately and the children came fast they came very fast all three were just a year apart mm -hmm. so i ended up with three babies it, 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 it brought a little challenge but the beauty of it is that their father who was a very supportive dad and he was of such great help to me. The responsibilities were shared. Wonderful. It was shared. So he would, would you believe he would, in the mornings for them to go to school, and I'm talking from preschool up to primary school, he would get up, shower them, and then he would go fix their breakfast while I get them dressed and comb their hair. And what he did, he was also a teacher. Ah, okay. So he got them into schools, which was very close to his workplace, right? So for preschool, they attended a school close by him. So he would take them to school 
pick them up and take them back home. For um, for parent teachers meeting, right? He he would be already down there. What I would do, I would go on my own, be there, and both of us would be at the parent teachers meeting. Wow! And then we come home together. Now, when they got bigger and were attending high school, now I would he what he would do drop off and pick up. I would be the one attending the parent teachers um, meeting, but he would pick us, um, pick me back up. But the responsibilities were shared and he was also when he comes on to helping with his children. You know, that's wonderful, especially if you have young husbands that are listening or young partners that are listening. It is absolutely necessary. That's how it was in my home as well where I had a father who was as engaged in our activities as much as our mother. And um, you know, you said you had three very successful girls. I'm absolutely sure that that maternal plus um, combined with the paternal, both coming together to parent them, to show them love. And we talk about parent teachers meeting. There are a lot of men who feel that that is for the mother. Right. I'm sure there are some men who does that, but I think it's a good thing to, to, to share that when you, when you have a partner that helps, the burden gets lighter. It's difficult, but you're not alone. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. Um, so I know your children are successful and you share a little bit of your, your you know, your husband's um, working to, to help them to focus on education. As you reflect on your family, what are you most proud about and why? I'm very proud of my, my daughter's accomplishment and achievement. Those girls, they did well in school. There's, I remember growing up, I was always told about in every family, there is a black sheep. Mm -hmm. So if you have two, one is a black sheep, one mm -hmm. will do well, the other is a black sheep. And if you have three, one, well, I never experienced that. My three daughters did equally well in school. And I'm so proud that they, they um, transitioned straight from high school into university. And they have done well. They have accomplished on their own. I like their, they are so independent at an early age. They never have to wait on partners to help them. My girls bought their homes from years ago. Yeah. And one sets the example and the others follow. And I'm so, they, they are so well established and independent. And honestly, I'm not saying that they are all there, but they have achieved and they, they have, have achieved, they have achieved well. They and have been proud. And my grandchildren, because it is, you mentioned family, my grandchildren, they too are doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. My grandson, he is now pursuing a degree in animation at the University of Technology. Nice. I can't wait to see where that gets him after a while. I think you would know that I mean, it's, it's, it should be a big thing. Yes. My granddaughter recently, like in May, graduated summa cum laude Ooh. at the prestigious Howard University. The two younger ones now, Noah, yes. who will soon be in high school. Yes. He just graduated on Monday of this week. She graduated from Immaculate Prep mm -hmm. with um, excellence in, 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 at, in about four subjects, inclusive of Spanish. So wow. you see, like grandmother, like granddaughter, Doing that extremely well. That and is my fun. and my baby grand granddaughter. She has just graduated from kindergarten one <laughs> at Immaculate Prep. She's five years old. 
<laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I'm so proud of my family. <laughs> you know, um, it speaks to foundation. I really feel that it speaks to foundation. It is that foundation that your husband and yourself laid for those girls. And yes. they're doing the same for their family. As, as I disclosed, um, Trisha is my friend and I know how much she pours into Noah. So I, I, I know how important. That's true. Yes. That sometimes I think she pushes Noah too much. <laughs> but it works because Noah yes. is doing extremely well. He's doing extremely well. Academic excellence is something that she has excelled at for quite a bit. Thank you so much. So now we are going to pivot to retirement. So a few years ago, you retired. What has life been like since your retirement? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I retired in the year 2012. Shortly after retirement, you know, I must tell you that I looked forward to my retirement. I yearned for retirement. I was getting tired. <laughs> and the level of indiscipline I uh -huh. couldn't manage any longer. So I looked forward to my retirement. So, and I, I planned for it. So I told myself that I'm not going home to get bored. I know I would be involved in somehow. But what happened shortly after retirement? I was employed at an office to help the employees with Spanish. And Desiree, that was such, you know, we refer to things as a nice break. Yes. It was a nice break for me. Mm -hmm. And can I tell the, our viewers that you contributed to that? <laughs> you can go ahead and tell them. <laughs> because that's my, my daughter's office. I got the job there because my daughter works there. But you, Desiree, you were the one who employed me. <laughs> And you were in my class. And it was so good. It, I, I enjoyed. It was so good having to deal with adults now for all the years I've been dealing with the children. It was such a, 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 a nice transition into um, having to teach adults now. Mm -hmm. you know, I know I wouldn't have any problem with in the, in, 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 um, in the class. And I was enjoying it. I was enjoying it. Believe me, it was so good. Uh -huh. But then, in less than a year of enjoying that new, after retirement employment, <laughs> then I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that became a stumbling block. Now. Uh -huh. So I had to quit that. Yes. So. And I Yes, and I know it's I know it's going to be difficult for you to talk about, but I think it's no, important. it's not difficult because All that right. is who I overcame. No, I love to talk about. Okay, it. go ahead and, and share know, that experience with us. You mean my journey with the, with cancer? Yes. Gosh, that was a journey. Um, when I was when I was first diagnosed, Desmond, can I tell you that I wasn't even I don't know. I'm wondering if I, I wasn't even that concerned. As a matter of fact, when I um, did the, I did a mammogram, right? The mammogram says um, it was just nodules. First, a lump was discovered. A lump was discovered. So I had to do a mammogram. The mammogram said it was just nodules, nothing to worry about. But I was not comfortable walking around with a lump in my breast. Nodules, nothing to worry about. Even when I took the results to my practitioner, he said, he called me Teacher Dawson. He said, Teacher Dawson, they say it's nodules, nothing to worry about. But I still was not um, comfortable. When I say comfortable, but I wasn't, I wasn't stressed. I wasn't depressed. But I still had it in the back of my mind that I'm going to check this out. Mm -hmm. Because I don't joke with my, um, my health. No. So I remember I was listening to, I listened to all medical um, 
programs and all that. And I was listening to this program the morning. It was on TVJ, Smile Jamaica, and a urologist was on, and he was being interviewed, and that is exactly what the, they were talking about, breast mm -hmm. cancer. And mm -hmm. when the urologist mentioned that a mammogram sometimes does not pick up what is really there, and the interviewer said to him, so what should the patient do? And he said, um, a breast MRI, a breast, do a breast MRI. And Desri, I got up immediately. I was by one of my daughters. I got up immediately and I called my doctor and I just said to him, I would like to do a breast MRI like now. And he says, why teacher Dawson? And I told him, he says, okay, come for the, 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 request, the request form. And I drove over to Portmore mm -hmm. immediately. I got dressed, drove over to Portmore, and I did the, um, and I, I picked up the form. I went to the lab. I did the breast MRI. Mm -hmm. But after doing the MRI, I was called by a doctor to say, uh, I am to um, come in and do an ultrasound. And she would give me the ultrasound free. Mm -hmm. So I went and I did the ultrasound. But while doing the ultrasound, she said to me, you know, this um, I'm doing this ultrasound, this lump is, is there, and I have no clue what this lump is about, which means that I think the breast MRI, I didn't tell her anything either. So she says, um, you know what? I think you should do a biopsy. Mm -hmm. And to cut a long story short, I will tell you, I did the biopsy, not the same day, but I did the biopsy, mm -hmm. and it was the biopsy now that picked up. Um, that was picked cancer. Up cancer, yes. And I remember I read the, when I took, when I picked up the report, I read it, I stopped and I read it on my way up, and I saw infiltrating duct carcinoma. Wow. And I still had no clue what that, what that was. No, I had no clue. And I called my daughter and I said, Kim, I just picked up my report and it says, she answered me quite nicely. And she, um, I said, I just picked up my report and it says infiltrating, no, but before I, I said, I say, I just picked up my report, but I think I'm going to take it down to my doctor because I have no clue what it is saying. So I'm going to take it to my practitioner. So I said, um, it says infiltrating duct carcinoma. It's as if the line was dead. Wow. I'm hearing nothing from the other end. So I said, Kim, are you still there? And she's, she said, it's as if I, I never had a stammer child, <laughs> but she got stammer that evening. Mm -hmm. And she said, and she, so I said, what is it? She said, okay, mommy, took it, take, take it down to your, to your doctor. And by the time she said that, I drove to a friend and I said, you know, I got the report and I think something is not so good. And I told her, you know, Kim's reaction. Um, so she said, then how you, she said, you, then you're not sad. <laughs> I said, I don't know what to be sad about. She said, but it seems as if something is wrong. We said, yes, but then. I am like that. Yes. I don't get depressed easily or stressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I took it down to the doctor. Before I reached the doctor, I was called by my other daughter, Nikki, to tell me she'll be coming down to the doctor with me. Mm -hmm. She's now in bog walk. Mm -hmm. Then um, Trisha called and said, mommy, I'm coming down to the doctor. So I say, yes, man, something is mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but still not so bothered. And when I reached the doctor's office, Trisha was already there. Trisha got there before me. <laughs> so the doctor, he just um, put me, he just gave me, um, he referred me now to a, um, a surgeon. Yes. Right. So he referred me to a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I contacted the surgeon myself for all my pre-surgery visits. My, do my daughter's 
were there with me. Wonderful. All three were there. Mm -hmm. So if one comes to pick me up and we're there alone, then the other two would come. So the, a great support system mm -hmm. is what helps you mm -hmm. through those difficult times. Yeah. And I had that great support system from my immediate family, my daughters. Mm -hmm. I got it from my extended family, even from my church family mm -hmm. and, and friends. I had a great support system and I did the surgery and I was quite, um, and I'm quite fine <laughs> up to this point. I did the surgery. The worst part of everything though was not even the surgery. The worst part of everything was chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to share a little bit about how you struggled through that? The chemotherapy. Before starting chemotherapy, there were some people who told me not to do it. Mm -hmm. But I had to listen to my daughters. Mm -hmm. Right? They are my greatest support, my closest right. support. And they, none of the three, thought that I should not have done it. So they, are, they encouraged me to do it. Mm -hmm. So... When I did that, that first session of chemotherapy, wow, yes, it was like hell. Wow. It made me, I kept, I keep describing it as, it made me feel as if I want to run away from myself. It, 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 it made me feel so, everything, even the things that I love, like fruits, mangoes are my favorite fruit, or mango is my favorite fruit. And they would buy me mangoes, and the mangoes would taste poisonous. Everything tasted really bad. And I started, I had um, long locks at that time. And yes. From, and from the very first chemotherapy session, I started losing the hair. Mm -hmm. Yes, I lost. And I could feel it, Desiree, and I could feel it in my sleep. I could feel the hair when it is detaching from the root. Yes. So yes. I lost the hair, but still, it wasn't a bother to me. <laughs> what, 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 what is it about your personality, you think? that or your experience in life that allows you to deal with difficult moments in such a resilient way? I think I, I am just a clown by nature. <laughs> I was always a clown around a lot from childhood, even up to this moment and everything I joke about. And I think I think that's just me. I, I think I was made that way. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing really bothers me to the extent where I'm going to be depressed or stressed or I'm going to, even if you hurt me, mm -hmm. I forget it easily. Wonderful. I forget it easily. Mm -hmm. And while I'm talking to you again, I said, what we it? <laughs> I'm really talking to Desreen after what she has done to me. I'm, I, I think I'm very free spirited. Yes. Yes. I, I, I know that about you. And um, it's that joyful heart. It's that, it's that joyful spirit. And, and, and I think, yes, go ahead. One thing I need to mention, it was also my faith in God. That's right. That's it right. Was also, my faith in God yes. and my strong support system mm -hmm. that brought me through. Yes, somebody says it takes a village, and 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 I would say yes, it takes a network, you know, and and then your own resilient spirit, that right. which will not will not allow anything to rob you, as you say, of 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 um, just being fun, just being fun to be around. And, and I remember the hair going, I, I, I did remember that. 
uh, but you are here and you're 70, you just celebrated your 70th birthday. And look at you, looking fantastic. Thank right. you. <laughs> so you beat it, you beat the cancer, you're cancer free. And that is fantastic. Now, you also took on the spelling bee. Now tell us yes. why would you, why would you, you could garden, you could bake, you could cook. But I still do, I still, I did all of that. And, and I'm still doing all of that. So tell us about how did you get into spelling bee? All right. So after retirement, as I tell you, I'm not going home to be static. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to um, get involved somehow, somewhere. So part of that involvement was getting attached to my um, to a senior citizens club. And that comes out of my church, the Portmore Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I quickly joined the club. And the club is, um, we are under the umbrella of the National Senior Citizens Council, National Council for Senior Citizens. Right. Right. So we don't just meet aimlessly. Mm -hmm. So when we when we have our meetings, we um and we have a um parish we have a parish coordinator. Mm -hmm. So we would get um the schedule from our parish coordinator, schedule of the activities for the year. Mm -hmm. And when I looked through the schedule, I saw the different activities. And listen, one thing about me that I didn't say. I am competitive. I like to compete, but I love to win. If I lose, I will cry. <laughs> I have to win. So when I looked at the um, when I looked and I saw spelling bee contest, and I saw Bible quiz, mm -hmm. I was there. I said, which one should I do? Which but one? immediately, I I I was drawn to the spelling bee, and I think I love to spell. And when I, I, I told the president that I want to do the spelling bee, I want to do the spelling bee. So I want to represent my club that way and also to represent my parish because mm -hmm. it is done on a parish okay. level. Mm -hmm. So I was told which book, and guess what, Desiree? We use the same spelling bee book as the younger children yes and the book is divided in two parts where you have the simple words and the difficult words mm -hmm. and we as senior citizens had to study the difficult words mm. but i like the challenge mm -hmm. i was happy that it wasn't the simple words i like the channel and when i looked at the words oh gosh they were so they were so big <laughs> long words but because of my love for the English language as well. Yes. I took on that challenge. I joyfully took on that challenge. Mm -hmm. So tell us about, how, did you have support to, to prepare? Do you, did you, how did you do it all by yourself? You know, most of it. I remember last year, my, my grandchildren would help me at times. They would, and, and my family, when they come over for family dinner on Sundays, when I cook for them every Sunday, when they come over, they, um, they would help me. And as a matter of fact, they would only have, they would even have the competition among themselves. <laughs> yes. So they helped me. So I entered last year, you know, mm -hmm. and I came second mm -hmm. last year. Yes. Saint Anne beat me to it. <laughs> so you, you were you were in the last two, but you lost. Right. Okay. Right. And so what did what how did that, you know, how did that affect you or impact how you prepare for this year? I um this man <laughs> put out more because guess what? I am determined to win. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was, um, and I saw what took place the last week. Listen, I never expected to see anyone better than I am, you know, to be honest. 
And that lady from St. Anne, she was very good. Yes. And she beat me to it. <laughs> so I said, okay, next year. I couldn't wait for the contest for this year. Yeah. I couldn't wait for it, Des. And so, but this year now, I took on because it is a bit challenging when you don't have a coach. I understand that you see the children, they all have um coaches. right mm -hmm. their coaches. And this um year I said, no, I need a coach, a full-time coach. Mm -hmm. But you know what was my problem? The words, nobody in my circle were able to pronounce the words except for my like my 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 my, my grandchildren and my children. Mm -hmm. But anyway, my good friend, Sister Harris, Maiselin, Maiselin Harris, <laughs> took that on. Wonderful. Yes, and she she did she did a very good job. Wow. With me and for me. Yes, and she you would, won. She would video call me, and we go through the words. And the irony irony in this is that sometimes. I will tell her the, how, how the word pronounced for her to tell me. I know which word comes like she took she, the one before. Yes. And when she says, Lord, is what the snow? I said, what was the last word you gave me? And I know which word comes after. I said, oh. And she's here. a fellow retiree, yes. isn't she? she? Same so. Mm -hmm. She said, same so. And, mm -hmm. you know, that having the coach at that, and it was like, um in the latter just 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 shortly before the the, the contest it wasn't from the beginning mm -hmm. but it was of great help to me wonderful it was wonderful. a great help to me so you you got a trophy you you you, you got a prize you 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 how do it i got so many um prizes oh. the, the big trophy is for the parish right is that my name will be inscribed on it Wonderful. For, for, and you're, you're for, for the year 2020. Right. And you're going to defend your title the next time? No, I can't. I have to sit out for three years. Oh, after you win. Oh, it's after okay. Winning. Fair after enough. Fair enough. Years, <laughs> I'm not allowed to enter. So after three years, when I'm 73, I don't think I'm going to bother. Yes. So we have just about um, 12 minutes or so left. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment, but um, this, this story um, is about inspiring and educating others. So you're sitting out three years. Um, what has that experience taught you about yourself that, that you failed and then you came back what did what did it teach you about yourself what it teaches me is that how to deal with um mishaps yeah and when they come you know mm -hmm. you know to expect that anything can mm -hmm. happen mm -hmm. and the important thing is how you deal with what happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody says 10% um, is what happened to you. 90% is how you deal with it. It's how you pour yourself in it. It's how you went back and you found a coach. It's how, although you're competitive, um, you understand that somebody else could win. But you are still determined that at some point in time, I want my I name. I want to win. And I think it's an inspiration to not just older people, <clears throat> but younger people that, you know, we will fail sometimes. Sometimes it will things will not go our way. But you get up, they say you brush yourself off and you do what you needed to do. And this time you got a coach. You got someone to, to work with you who had the time. Now, I want to ask you this question. Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? What are you doing, Janet, in the next 10 years? What are you what are you up to? I will still be a grandmother on call. Right now I'm a grandmother on call. I hope to still be able 
to be with my my family you know if my daughters are not around and, and you know, i can sit in for them um honestly i don't see myself as um being laid up i see myself as being still on the move mm -hmm. able to exercise in the mornings to continue my exercise in the mornings to 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 con um continue to be because even what retirement has done for me you know it has um it has given me more time for myself it has given me more time for my family it has given me more time for the lord as well great great there's a question and for you there's a question it it comes from someone called noah leo do you have a favorite grandchild? If so, who? I have four favorite grandchildren. Thank I, you. I, I usually call my grandson because he's my only grandson. So I call him my favorite grandson. Okay. Um, there's another question. What was the main motivating factor that drove you to enter after your loss? You mean to enter the spelling bee again? Yes, yes. As I said, it was my determination to win. <laughs> and I see where I can win. Yes. Because I was disappointed mm -hmm. when I didn't win. So I know I had to go back to win. Yes. Because that was my aim. Yes. I, had to I had to represent my club well. And to represent my parish well. Yes, yes. And, and, you I know, had, and, 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 and I and I had the capacity. I know I was capable of winning. Mm -hmm. So great. Oh, the questions are coming in. What has been the most exciting aspect of your retirement? Wow, travel. I have been traveling since retirement. Wow. It is it is because of the, the, the pandemic mm -hmm. that I didn't travel last year or this year. Mm -hmm. But I have been traveling with my daughters, and that's a more this doesn't I would not travel, I would not take a plane. Listen, I'm not scared of flights. I love, I love flying. Yes. So it's not scared of flights where I say I won't travel without my daughters and my grandchildren. I just like that family togetherness and we go on the plane together. So that is my most, I've been traveling since. Prior to, night, to, to 2012, when I didn't, um, my last time traveling was 1998. Wow. Wow. And I spent Christmas in Florida after my whole life as a wife and mother and grandmother i have never spent a christmas outside of jamaica and outside of westmoreland mm -hmm. yet yes. on my first christmas of retirement my first retirement christmas was spent in orlando florida with my Wonderful. sister and my whole family was with me great great that's wonderful and you know there is something that I'm learning from you as well. It is that we limit ourselves. We, we tell ourselves, as I get older, my brain cannot manage this or that. But you have, you've proven that you can take that book. Because honestly, sometimes I watch the spelling bee and I hear some words that I've never heard them before. And you have to break them down and the yes. pronunciation, etc. And you did it. And you did it. And what it shows is that most of the time we are the one who limit ourselves to say, That's I'm too old for this and I'm too old for that. Because all of us are getting older. Even if you're young, if you're a young person listening, oh, you're going to get there. It's coming. Each day, you're old. <laughs> one day older every day. But, but I think the thing about you is how you approach life. You have a team approach to life. I can I, I hear that your family, your support system, 
is your team. And I think um, having that support and your fun side, I have been the recipient of your fun side, your jokes. Um, we could have you on in a session to give jokes only. <laughs> But I want to say thank you so much for, for being here and for sharing your story. And do you have anything that you want to leave with our audience this afternoon? Anything you want them to ponder from your story, from your life experiences? I want to let everyone know, and it has to do with my cancer, mm -hmm. where I would tell others to that your health is your responsibility mm -hmm. and do not choke around with your health. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You do your checks that you're supposed to do. We have some people saying, I don't want to know. I don't mm -hmm. want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's very silly talk. Yes. You should want to know. You should want to hear that you can get on top of things yes. early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And for, 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 for retirees, what I want to say to them, don't deactivate or inactivate your brain. Activate it, live life, yes. enjoy life. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a support group, you can create one. Wonderful. You, know, you choose choose to talk to people who are positive, mm -hmm. right? Because um, even sometimes, you know, even though our friends mean mean us well, there are times when they will give advice that is not really, you know, they will give you um, negative advice. Mm -hmm. Not deliberately, yes. But you know they mean well. But you must know for yourself what advice to take. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That is, I mean, I can't add anything to what you have just said. It just wraps everything up. Thank you so much for being here, Janet, and for telling your story, your compelling story for being. I always thank people for being vulnerable because not everybody wants to to share, you know, their journey, especially a journey like cancer. So thank you so very much for being here. Now, I have good news for my audience. We're going to have a second edition of um, Conversations Live on the 15th, but that is going to happen at 11 a.m. If, if you're able to join us, we will have, we'll be having someone, her name is Simone Morris, and she will be joining us for another edition of Conversations Live. Again, if you're here for the first time and you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that the next time Conversations Live or whether there's a, another video giving you some valuable information, you can be notified. Thank you so much, Janet, for telling your story. Thank you to my audience for always being there for me. I am going to give a shout out to somebody um, who I saw, I saw Sonia, I, and I also saw, saw Janine, I saw Trisha. Thank you guys for your support of this program. And please remember to share, share, share with everyone. And if you have a compelling story that you believe that you can share on Conversations Live, or you know someone with a compelling story, I invite you to write to us at info at legacyhrm.com. That's info at legacyhrm.com and let's talk about it. Who knows, maybe one day you will be here sharing your compelling story. Thank you so much for being with us. And Thank you, Des. I hope I was inspirational. You inspired me. You did inspire me. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, this has been another edition of Conversations Live.